Part 2. There are many for whom the qualification of desirelessness is a difficult one, for they feel that they are their desires, that if their distinctive desires, their liking and disliking, are taken away from them, there will be no self left. But these are only they who have not seen the Master. In the light of His only presence all desire dies, but the desire to be like Him. Yet before you have the happiness of meeting Him face to face, you may attain desirelessness if you will. Discrimination has already shown you that the things which most men desire, such as wealth and power, are not worth having. When this is really felt, not merely said, all desire for them ceases. Thus far all is simple. It needs only that you should understand. But there are some who forsake the pursuit of earthly aims only in order to gain heaven, or to attain personal liberation from rebirth. Into this error you must not fall. If you have forgotten self altogether, you cannot be thinking when that self should be set free, or what kind of heaven it shall have. Remember that all selfish desire binds, however high may be its object, and until you have got rid of it, you are not wholly free to devote yourself to the work of the Master. When all desire for self are gone, there may still be a desire to see the result of your work. If you help anyone, you want to see how much you have helped him. Perhaps even you want to see it too and to be grateful. But this is still desire, and also want of trust. When you pour out your strength to help, there must be a result, whether you can see it or not. If you know the law, you know this must be so. So you must do right for the sake of the right, not in hope of reward. You must work for the sake of the work, not in the hope of seeing the result. You must give yourself to the service of the world because you love it and cannot help giving yourself to it. Have no desire for psychic powers. They will come when the Master knows that it is best for you to have them. To force them to soon often brings its train much trouble. Often their possessor is misled by deceitful nature spirits, or become conceited and thinks he cannot make a mistake, and in any case the time and strength that it takes to gain them might be spent in work for others. They will come in the course of development. They must come. And if the Master sees that it would be useful for you to have them sooner, he will tell you how to unfold them safely. Until then, you are better without them. You must guard, too, against certain small desires which are common in daily life. Never wish to shine or to appeal clever. Have no desire to speak. It is well to speak little. Better still to say nothing, unless you are quite sure that what you wish to say is true, kind, and helpful. Before speaking, think carefully whether that you are going to say has those three qualities. If it is not, do not say it. It is well to get used even now to thinking carefully before speaking, for when you reach initiation you must watch every word, lest you should tell what must not be told. Much common talk is unnecessary and foolish. When it is gossip it is wicked. So be accustomed to listen rather than to talk. Do not offer opinions unless directly asked for them. One statement of the qualification gives them thus, to know, to dare, to will, and to be silent, and that last of the four is the hardest of them all. Another common desire which you must sternly repress is the wish to meddle in other men's business. What another man does or says or believes is no affair of yours, and you must learn to let him absolutely alone. He has full right to free thought and speech and action, so long as he does not interfere with anyone else. You yourself claim the freedom to do what you think proper. You must allow the same freedom to him and when he exercises it, you have no right to talk about it. If you think he is doing wrong, and you can contrive an opportunity of privately and very politely telling him why you think so, it is possible that you may convince him, but there are many cases in which even that would be an improper interference. On no account must you go and gossip to some third person about the matter, for that is an extremely wicked action. If you see a case of cruelty to a child or an animal, it is your duty to interfere. If you see any one breaking the law of the country, you should inform the authorities. If you are placed in charge of another person in order to teach him, it may become your duty gently to tell him of his faults. Except in such cases, mind your own business and learn the virtue of silence.